Hello everybody. I'm here to talk about governance or how to operate in multi-actor contexts. In other words, why governance and stakeholder involvement are important for innovative metropolitan solutions. In this video, I will give you examples of multi-level and networked governance. Governance is defined as the architecture of interactions between three large sectors of society the private sector and the public sector, the public sector and civil society, and the civil society and the private sector. In liberal democracies, these large sectors are in positive tension with each other. This means that by applying pressure on one another, they produce checks and balances that keep each sector in line with societal needs. Metropolitan innovators must understand and operate in complex systems of governance because that will allow them to make better decisions and deliver better solutions. Like in the example of how the governance of the city of Delhi in India is organized. But metropolitan innovators must be able to design new relationships and tools to articulate different actors and create new forms of collaboration. This will allow them to deliver much better tailored and realistic solutions. Let's take an example of governance in which multiple levels of governance are involved in the management and the design of the built environment. Let us look at the City of London in the UK. The City of London is a county within the large metropolis of London. Its origins can be traced to the Roman period when it was called Londinium. It now represents only a tiny part of Greater London, occupying an area of one by one mile in the center of the metropolis. However, it concentrates an enormous power with a large number of headquarters of the most powerful financial institutions in the world. It is considered by many as the main engine of British economy. The City of London is a great example of multi-level governance. It is managed as a ward which elects the members of the Court of Commons and the Court of Aldermen. This ward is managed by the City of London Corporation, a unique form of local government which has lots of responsibilities concerning the management and the design of the built environment. But the City of London is part of the Local Government Association and London Borough Council and belongs to the Greater London Authority. The Greater London Authority belongs to the Council of English Regions and belongs, of course, to the nation of England and to the United Kingdom and, finally, to the European Union. The European Union is not even the largest of all stakeholders involved. The EU has to abide to international treaties and supranational institutions like the United Nations, the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. This has consequences on energy management and caps on carbon emissions, for example. This was an example of governance of a territory. But let's look at the governance of a sector, in this case, housing. In Western Europe, national governments have traditionally had a big say in how housing is delivered to citizens. But this is changing quickly. The Netherlands, for example, has sophisticated arrangements in which the national government collaborates across sectors, levels and many actors in order to deliver high quality housing. This involves collaborations with many levels and sectors of governments, but also with developers builders, service providers, citizens, the users, NGOs, designers and others involved in the complex process of delivering housing. Social housing, for example, is coordinated by large and powerful NGOs called housing corporations that have the delivery of affordable, high-quality housing as their core mission. In short, 
As Eberlein and Kevert point out, multi-level governance involves a large number of decision-making arenas, differentiated along both functional and territorial lines, and interlinked in a non-hierarchical way. But there is another dimension to governance. Governance is not only multi-leveled, it is also networked. Policy making and implementation is shared by politicians, technocrats, experts, dedicated agencies, independent authorities, semi-private organizations, private companies, the public, a large number of NGOs, pressure groups, interest groups, etc. They constitute networks of decision-making across levels, territories and mandates. This means that metropolitan innovators must adopt a new attitude towards problem identifying and problem solving. They must find new forms of steering complex governance networks that are more democratic, inclusive and flexible. The key words are deliberation, bargaining, and compromise-seeking. Multi-level and network governance also present us with new challenges. If decision-making is shared across multiple levels and networks, who is ultimately responsible for the outcomes of policies and decisions? There is a huge problem of accountability. Also, decision-making never takes place in leveled arenas. Different actors have very different capacities, voices and access to information and knowledge. There are huge asymmetries of power. There are also vulnerable groups who have a hard time making their voices heard. Ethnic minorities, the elderly, children and women, for example, have had traditionally little saying on how cities are managed and designed. For this reason, some planners and designers have taken up the task to become advocates for these groups in order to make their voices heard in metropolitan innovation. Participation and advocacy in planning and design processes are on the rise. Advocacy is just one of the multiple roles metropolitan innovators can have in governance-based design. They could be managers, articulators, negotiators, facilitators, directors, process designers. There is a variety of new roles emerging in a context of deep societal change. This is very different from the traditional roles metropolitan innovators have had in the past. What do you want your role to be? Metropolitan innovators themselves have changed. While this role has been traditionally occupied by men, we can now observe that many more women, members of ethnic and religious minorities, are planning and designing cities in countries around the world. So, to summarize, understanding the roles and interests of a large number of actors will help you. Define the challenges at hand, address them in a more realistic way. Collect relevant knowledge from a variety of actors that would otherwise not be accessible to you. Design implementation processes that will ensure the success of your project. Finally, it will enable you to design new relationships that will empower people and make them participants of metropolitan innovation. This will strengthen democracy and ensure social sustainability. I hope you start imagining what kinds of partnerships and synergies between actors you can promote in your projects to achieve a sustainable, fair and prosperous city.